glad you quieted down. I was just getting ready to break into dance. <laughs> Get your attention. Glad I didn't have to do that. Good afternoon and welcome to a special edition of the Millsaps Friday Forum. Uh, this happens to be, today's forum happens to be the second event in our homecoming celebration for 2018. You may notice that two of our panelists are wearing medals with purple um, uh, uh -oh. ribbons. ribbons. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're my go-to person now. Yeah, she's uh, two of our panelists are wearing purple ribbons. They are new inductees into the major generals um, club or association or group, I guess. For uh, The major generals um, group is for alums who have experienced or are experiencing their 50th reunion, and that today is for the class of 1968. And we're thrilled to have um, several of the class members here. Wave your hand if you're new inductees to the Mayor of We're glad to have you all back. Thanks for all you've done for Millsaps, and, uh, and we're, we're glad to celebrate homecoming with you. Today's forum actually plays off the 1968 50th reunion uh, by looking at uh, major changes. Millsaps in 1968 and 50 years earlier. Um, and so we have a panelist, uh, a group of panelists that I'm going to let um, Dr. Wolf introduce in just a moment. I will say quickly that one of the things that makes me most proud to be a Millsaps major is the fact that we're not afraid to look at our history and ourselves honestly uh, and to deal with uh, those times when both we've had great successes but maybe we haven't necessarily done things exactly the way that they, they have. So I look forward to another uh, open, honest, candid conversation that will enrich our community in meaningful ways. The moderator of the panel is a, uh, a special friend and colleague of mine, Stephanie Wolf, is an associate professor of history who, whose specialty is white resistance uh, in civil rights movements, and she is quickly becoming a national and international uh, expert. Uh, who's been called on in, in many, many different venues uh, to, to share her scholarship and help inform the, uh, the scholarship of uh, white resistance movements. So uh, Stephanie is also, as a, uh, an, in addition to being an associate professor at Millsaps, she is the uh, academic director of the Shepherd Higher Education for Poverty Consortium. I think I got most of that right. All the words were there. They may not have been in the right, in the right order. Uh, but that's a poverty studies consortium that consists of 20 some odd schools across the country and Millsaps is um, honored to be the academic home of that consortium. Basically because we had Luanda Evans, our, our, uh, um, uh, our sociology professor, and Stephanie Rolfe uh, as that academic director. So Millsaps gets to be the home for that uh, the program for the, for the next couple of years anyway. So without further ado, I'll introduce Stephanie Rolfe and let her tell you about our class. Thank you, Keith. Good afternoon. It's always a pleasure for me to participate in these kinds of, of forums because I'm not only affiliated with the college now um, through a paycheck, but I also um, am part of the class of 1999. So I'm happy to welcome back my sisters and brothers to our home and to talk through some of your experiences. And as a historian, all of this is quite meaningful to me. As Keith pointed out, a lot of my work looks at white Southern resistance to the Civil Rights Movement, especially in the South. But as I have kind of moved forward and beyond the initial stages of my research, I've begun to realize that a lot of what the white South was doing in the 1960s had a lot of resonance outside of the South as well. And right now, I'm really sort of steeped in 1968 and some of the, some of the work that I'm looking at, and especially with the anti-poverty consortium that I'm affiliated with and thinking about the war on poverty, to say nothing of our contemporary political moment. And when I was preparing for my opening comments today, I was thinking about conversations I was having with students two years ago. 
when we were nearing the election. And students were sort of reflecting, many of them were about to participate in their first presidential election. So this was a meaningful moment for them, and, and I will say they were a little disappointed with their choices. And as a historian, I was curious about why they felt that way. And they were sort of observing this increasing polarization, trying to figure out where their vote was going to go. And I would often get the question from them, what does this look like in your historical memory? What, where, when have we been here before? And I regularly said, I don't think we have been. And that wasn't entirely true. There were historians really across the country who were reflecting on what this campaign looked like. And there were various um, offers, various um, hypotheses about what presidential election this, this reflected. And a lot of historians started migrating towards George Wallace's campaign in 1968. And that has some resonance, I think, thinking about sort of a, um, a candidate who represents an outsider or someone who comes in um, and sort of leverages growing anxieties and fears about change, um, changing versions of success, new obstacles and old, to say nothing of all of the other things that were going on in 1968 as the women's liberation movement began to become more visible in sort of a new phase of the black liberation movement and looking at issues of black power um, and you know some of its iterations on the West Coast and in places like Chicago. Um, the presidential election and, and the, the events that surrounded the Chicago Convention, all of those things are events that, that I don't have to remind you of. And in fact, in my memory, they don't exist, um, but they, they exist in my training. And so I'm really anxious to open this up for discussion and for us to share this as a Millsaps community. When I was here in um, the fall of 1995 is when I started and I graduated in 99, and I was thinking about what historical moment really defines my experience here. And to be honest, it was the Bill Clinton um, Lewinsky trial, which was just sort of, you know, like that, that issue was really sort of reaching some visibility in the fall of my senior year. And thinking about what that meant in terms of sexual identity and power and what we expect out of this highest office. So I won't elaborate any more on that, but we all have particular things, I think, that strike us when we're in some of those critical phases of our educational formation. And for our scholars who are here today, I encourage you to think about this really complex historical moment that you're in and begin to reflect on some of the things that are sitting with you heavy and, and forcing you to kind of rethink identity and expectations and definitions of success what will happen after graduation, and all of those questions that people regularly ask you, what next? So I am delighted to introduce you to our panel today, which is a great representation of 50 years ago and today, and how we can integrate our experiences as members of the Millsaps community. So I will just give a quick introduction um, and allow them to elaborate on their experiences and, and what they've done since. We have um, closest to me, David Doggett. Next to him, Alec Valentine, Sarah Del Castillo, and Karam Rahat, a really recent graduate, um, who are going to reflect on just a couple of questions um, related to their Millsaps experience and 1968 beyond where we're seeing some of the overlap and differences. Um, and so we're just going to have a couple of questions and let them weigh in on that. We really want to protect some time for you to participate, so um, please, please do so at your at your comfort level. Um, so we had sort of talked about when we were thinking about this how we can mix the then and the now. And the question that I want to offer to each one of the panelists is, um, and please feel free to remain. I have mics here, or you can come up here and use this mic. Um, I want you to think about along the lines of a really significant historical moment that you feel like defined your time at Millsap. So there were probably many, but what sticks out to you and why? So think along the spectrum of what's happening off this campus, but also what's resonating among the student body, what's 
surfacing in Millsap's classrooms? What are some of the conversations or heated discussions that you remember being involved in? Um, and I will just let you reflect on that. You want to get us started, David? Right, yeah. I'll come up there because I have some slides to do. <laughs> She told me to introduce you know, myself. Yeah. Um, she told me to introduce myself, and so I started trying to think about uh, what, what I, would, I would say, and I kept going back and back and back. So I'm going to start at the very beginning. The first doggy to come to America was a Reverend. Benjamin Doggett, who came to Virginia, he was Church of England, came to Virginia and he bought slaves. Uh, there was a David, Bishop David Seth Doggett, Methodist Bishop in Virginia. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? That's better. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, he was famous for using Christianity to defend slavery. Of course, he owned some. Uh, and then uh, my father was a Methodist preacher in North Mississippi. His family is from Karn, actually a little place out from Karn called Kasu. Uh, there were six kids in his family, three girls, three boys. They all came to Millsaps. My father was on the board of trustees of Millsaps. I came to Millsaps. Uh, and just briefly, uh, after Millsaps, I had a very checkered career. I published a newspaper called The Kudzu, which most of you probably the old ones remember. Uh, and then I lived around the South. I didn't know what to do for a while. Lived in uh, New Orleans. Ended up in Nashville. Uh, decided to go back to school. And uh, ended up at uh, University of Tennessee Knoxville. And I, I went into biology. My uh, degree here was in sociology. But I can't figure out what to do with it. So uh, I thought about going to med school, but I got interested in research and I went to University of Southern California, became a molecular biologist, and did that laboratory work for the first half of my career. Didn't have any big discoveries. And the last half of my career, I was uh, a medical research analyst and a medical writer who did statistics and stuff. And my last job was at Johns Hopkins. I still live in Baltimore. Um, and so that's, that's basically that. Now, what she wanted me to think of one thing. I had, I had much trouble thinking of one thing. I guess if I had to, so this one thing would be this right here, which happened uh, in, uh, when I was, I think I was a junior. Junior. And uh, there was a disturbance at Jackson State. The police came out and they shot into the crowd, and they shot a guy named uh, Benjamin Brown, who had been a civil rights worker. They recognized him. Uh, they shot him in the back and killed him. Uh, and so the next day, this happened like on the, at night, the next day, <clears throat> Lee Mabelson and I decided we have to have a march. And so we wanted to march downtown, march around the governor's mansion. Uh, and we were gonna march, it was just the two hours. So we ran around campus to try to find out who we could find, who they trying to find, who. and we ended up with something like 22 people, uh, all students, a couple of recent alumni <clears throat> from, the, from med school. Uh, and we got together and we marched downtown. And as you can see, we wore ties. We dressed up, the girls wore dresses. Uh, and so that's the, the, the most important thing that really sticks in my head. Uh, but really thinking about it, the most important thing of all of that stuff was the fast rate of change. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to try to convey that to you a little bit here. Uh, this little march, let me, uh, 
click on a few more pictures here. They're not in order, so I'm gonna have to. This is another part of the march. This is Carolyn Davis, yeah. <laughs> uh, Doug Rogers, Sue Barnes, Gary Alford. Uh, these pictures are from the Sovereignty Commission. They were surveillance pictures of us. Uh, and it's actually sort of fortunate that they have it because we didn't take pictures of ourselves. This actually, this march actually made the NBC news, national news. Uh, and everybody's family found out about it. Everybody in their little hometown found out about it. And it was a big, huge thing for those people that were on this march. Uh, let me just go through quickly. This is Jim Wade. I don't know if he's here this weekend. Jim Wade was the president of our class. He was a guard on the football team. And he, he, I was like leading the march, and he pushed me aside and got in front of me. This is the Sovereignty Commission list of names of people on the march. It lists us, it lists our hometowns. We're all there. <coughs> Now this march here was two years later, I believe, uh, 1970. This, another disturbance happened at Jackson State. It was right after uh, the big uh, problem at Kent State where the National Guard shot some students that were demonstrating against the war in Vietnam. So then the Jackson State students had a demonstration. Highway Patrol marched on campus right down the middle of Lynch Street. There was a big crowd in front, in front of the women's dorm, Alexander Hall, they shot into the crowd and killed several people, wounded a whole bunch of people. And so there was another march from Millsaps. And I, I was graduating this morning, I was doing the Kutsu, so this, I had nothing to do with this march. This march had 200 people, including faculty members. So that's how fast things change. It went from 22 people to 200 people in two years. Uh, and you can see, I mean, that some of the faculty wore ties, but everybody else is just dressed. This is Kay Sloan here. Uh, everybody's just wearing the school clothes. That's, that was our cover picture from the Jackson State event. Uh, this was another, this was for when uh, Secretary of Defense McNamara came to town. There was a march, and you can see, there we are, we're all dressed up. I got a coat and tie on. Yeah. Uh, I think that's that's probably about all of these. Oh no, this this one, this one. This is about two or three years after that. This was uh, we had a we were trying to get a little community center going called called Edge City in downtown Jackson for black and white kids to come together. And uh, this was a benefit we had at Costas Lodge. This is Fred McDowell. We went, went up to the Delta brought him down, and these are mostly high school students. We always, you know, when I was doing the cuts and all, we thought we were doing this for college students, but that high school students in, in Jackson caught on to it and, and did their own thing with it. In fact, they drug us into it. They went out and sold our newspaper to cut to the Callaway High School and got arrested. And so we all had to go out the next day, a whole bunch of Millsap students, about 20 people, went out there the next day to keep selling papers, and they all got arrested. And of course they dropped all the charges because there, there was nothing to it. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna stop here to just try to give you some sense of how fast things changed back then. Uh, we came along, we were the baby boomers, uh, I was born the year this, the first World War, the Second World War ended in 1946, and we every class, that, every school, every class in school was the biggest one ever. The one behind us was even bigger. They had to like build the schools bigger, um, and the whole culture was changing so fast. Elvis Presley came along, rock and roll came along, and rock and roll changed faster back then than it does now. There was a new dance every year. The style of music changed every year. We got into the 60s when we had the British invasion, the Beatles, and all of that stuff. Uh, what you can see here, this is Jackson's first hippies right here. Um, and then and the, the whole civil rights movement happened. 
segregation in it. I, I, I went all the way up into Millsaps in white schools. There was total segregation. Millsaps integrated, and within a few years, the high schools in Jackson were integrating, and everything changed. And the Vietnam War came along. That was a big deal. We ended that war. We caused Johnson to resign from office. Uh, so things were just, and we, we thought we were doing it sort of, but we also realized we were just swept up on this big thing. There were students in the streets in Paris. It was a huge thing that happened everywhere. And it's not happening now. You can, since then, people have tried to do what we did back then, and it's like beating your head up against the wall. It's just not the same kind of momentum that happens. And I can't tell you exactly why all of that happened, but I can tell you it was a huge, rapidly changing big thing. So we can talk a little bit about that and, and what we need to do today. But I think I'll end right there. Thank you, David. Thank you. Is this on? Okay. Thank you. My name is Alec Valentine, and, and uh, thank you for the <coughs> opportunity to be here. Um, I came here in 1964 from um, Greenwood, Mississippi, as did the former Marilyn Hitton and the former Penny Sanders, who are here. And I'll tell you, everybody in Greenwood is a real nice person. They are two of the nicest. <laughs> However, I'd heard what people said about Millsaps when Maybe when they didn't know I was listening. And Millsaps was, uh, even back then, to, to, some, to some people who were very consciously tied into uh, Mississippi's uh, racial uh, relationships as they were in the past, uh, to uh, that kind of folks. Millsaps was just Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, of liberalism. But, I got here and I looked at people like uh, Dr. Laney and Dr. Boyd and uh, Mr. Padgett and uh, Ms. Blackwell and all kind of people like that. And I thought, well, I, I know they're on the right side about this, but they're not saying much. What are they doing? I know they're doing something, but I can't tell. Um, is anybody really, quote, liberal or not? Um, I, I do want to say about Dr. T.W. Lewis, there was no question there. <laughs> but that's not because he said anything, much, not much. Um, he had a way of not even asking a question, just posing, getting some question posed or something, and then leaving the door open for you to walk through and fall through a hole and make a fool of yourself or something. I don't know how he did it, and he still does. And he'll stand there and smile and, you know, encourage you to pick yourself up and go on. Uh, but I wondered why uh, people were so uh, reticent, might be the word, I'm not sure. And, and, and I was afraid, uh, fearful about changes that I, that I felt like were coming and that Millsaps had to, uh, uh, that Mississippi finally had to face up to its, its terrible racist past and do something about it. Um, I, I knew, but I wasn't thinking about uh, the people that uh, people at Millsaps knew about, like Bob Katitsky and Rabbi Perry Nussbaum, who got their houses bombed uh, just for saying something rather mild uh, in criticism of, of uh, Mississippi's uh, racial situation. And then as far as colleges, it just didn't occur to me that uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was not a given that Millsaps would survive as a college because Millsaps had to raise money, as all colleges do. And in those days, it wasn't big money from off somewhere. It was from Mississippi, from the same uh, environment that I came out of and was a part of, uh, much of which was uh, riddled with racism and was very critical of Millsaps. Uh, um, you know, uh, Bellhaven, for example, almost didn't survive in the 70s, almost had to shut its doors. And I spent one year after Millsaps at George Peabody College in Nashville. In the late 70s, it had to sell itself to Vanderbilt. So there, it was not a given uh, that, that Millsaps would survive. Let me see now what I should tell you. Um, yeah, when we were freshmen, 
we all had to read a play called Mother Courage by Bertolt Brecht. And uh, Mother Courage was a uh, an, kind of an allegorical figure of, I would say, uncertain sexual identity, who uh, was pushing a cart through the worst ravages of war-torn Europe, trying to feed her children and to stay alive. And in order to do this, she, she prostituted herself a couple of times, she took part in some crimes, and she probably hurt some people. But uh, she stayed alive, and she kept her children alive. Well, uh, living in the world that he was in in those days, I was such an idealist, I thought everybody should speak out. And a whole institution like Millsap should take a firm stand and say what it believed in 1964 or 66 or 68 or something like that, which would have been suicide. Uh, so uh, it, it didn't exist in the kind of idealistic world that I thought, um, but it, it had to exist in the real world, and it was like uh, Mother Courage. It did what it had to do to survive. And uh, so it has survived so far. By survival, I mean uh, not just stay alive, but stay alive to, uh, to make the state of Mississippi look at itself, and to make the country look at itself, and to make us, uh, the students and the people, uh, look at uh, where we are, and what we are. So for that kind of reason, I'm, I'm glad that Millsap has survived. So that event was 50 years of survival. That was my event. <laughs> extremely high. I got here in 2010, and I don't know if any of you know Lamise Elsadek, who is an incredible alumni of Millsaps College, but she took me under her wing. She was a senior, and I thought she was the coolest woman I'd ever met in my life, and was just so appreciative that she took any interest in this little freshman. Um, and she took me to this like, no, like event um, where I met this man who told me to apply for this organization called YP4, or Young People 4. Um, and it's underneath a people for the American way. And this was my first introduction to having language around social justice. I had grown up understanding what discrimination was my whole life. My mother ran an immigration clinic and worked in Forest, Mississippi um, near the chicken plants. And I had seen racism my whole life. I had known what it was, but I never had language for it. I didn't really know what to do about it besides exist in this world and be a good person and fight against it, you know, just be like that, calling things out on daily, uh, when, when daily things happen, right? And so I didn't know that there were people all around the country who are networking, who are connected, who are doing things strategically to move against um, xenophobia, to, to move against policies that are affecting immigrants and all types of uh, people and so I went to this conference. I, I applied. I got accepted. Which I was like, oh my goodness, I'm so excited! I'm going to Washington D.C. for free, yay! And then I got there, and it was so much more than that. There were people who were activists, and they were 18 and 19, and I couldn't believe it. And I was learning so much. And so I came back. First of all, I told people I was from Mississippi, and they're like, what? I've never met anyone from Mississippi. Um, and so I was the only Mississippian there. And I, something happened, something grabbed hold of my spirit, and it was like, Mississippi has no representation here. Why are you the only person here? Why is everyone from New York? Why is everyone from California? Why is everyone from Florida and Texas? And so I, I started getting frustrated, and, but I also got energized, and I was like, I want to bring resources back to my state. I want to bring this knowledge back. I want more people from Millsaps to, to go to these places. And, I want to get involved in my community and see what my college is doing and what, what we can do in our own community. And so we decided to start an organization called Youth Organizers United through this um, organization called YP4 because they gave me like $500 to start an organization. I was so excited, $500 was so much to me back then. And we, we decided to take on the issue of anti-immigration in the United States, I mean in Mississippi. 
Um, fast forward, I um, met my mentor, whose name was Felipe Matos, who was an organizer in Florida, in Miami, Florida. And he um, and five people um, in his close circle decided to walk out of their door one day uh, to Washington, D.C., from Miami, Florida. And they said, we're going to walk to Washington, D.C. because there's a vote coming up for the DREAM Act. And we want to be there for that vote. And as we walk, literally, from Miami to Washington, D.C., we're going to tell people along the way what the DREAM Act is, and we're going to tell them who we are. We're undocumented, but we live here, we've been here, we are beautiful people, and we deserve to have rights to, to get an education and to work here and to exist here and live in safety. And so they walked, literally, to Washington, D.C., and the DREAM Act didn't pass, but I think it was two votes. So um, he was my mentor and he guided me through what, what was such a disappointing experience for him, but also he was like, we can't give up. And he's like, in the South, we can't give up. We have to continue. And so I met other organizers um, in Mississippi through him. One was Alex Ortiz, who was at Tougaloo College. And he was an undocumented student who had gotten a full scholarship to Tougaloo until they found out he was undocumented and they tried to take it away. And he went and researched the law and he said, actually, you're a private institution. You can give me the scholarship if you want to and you should give it to me because I'm really amazing. So this undocumented student advocated for himself at Tougaloo College, got his entire college paid for and ended up paging in the United States Capitol when we were in college in 2012. So that was really interesting, an undocumented student working in the US Capitol from Mississippi. Interesting, huh? And then I met Ingrid Cruz, who was an organizer living in Mississippi at the time. This is a funny story. She, uh, we were meeting about Youth Organizers United, and we were like, we need to do something. We, um, HB 488 is out, which was the Show Me Your Papers um, immigrant legisl anti immigrant legislation that was out at the time. We're like, what, what can we do about this? So Ingrid comes into our meeting one day and she goes, I quit my job, guys. We were like, what? She goes, I quit my job. I have to do this. And I'm going to start marching. And we're like, what are you, where are you going to march? She goes, I'm going to march to Memphis. We're going to reenact uh, James Meredith's March Against Fear. And we're going to do it. We're going to educate people about HB 488. And we're going to talk about anti-immigrant legislation along the way. We're going to march. So I was like, Ingrid, where are you going to live? She goes, I don't know. I said, well, my good men, I lived in Goodman at the time. I was like, my good men roommate moved out recently. Um, do you want to live with me? So Ingrid, sorry guys, Ingrid lived with me illegally at Millsaps College. And she also enjoyed the Millsaps uh, meal plan. And so all, all in the name of civil rights, um, <laughs> I put the key under my mat and she would kind of sneak in as cars were, um, she also didn't have a car. So she would walk in as cars were coming in and out of the South Gate and she would come and, get, and live in my dorm when she was around town. So, um, so all of us were organizing and we decided to call it Walk Against Fear because James Meredith actually did catch wind of this. Um, and he said, you know what? I had to march because I didn't have the right to walk safely. And he goes, Y'all, um, he was like, I support you in this, and I'll meet you in Memphis, and I'll be there at the Civil Rights Museum when you get there. Um, so we decided to call it Walk Against Fear, and as we, um, I, I didn't get to participate in the entire walk. I was there organizing it. I was there at the beginning and the end. But Ingrid and Alex walked the whole way, um, 222 miles to Memphis, Tennessee. And along the way, we were in these little teeny tiny towns throughout Mississippi, and we were having Know Your Rights trainings with immigrants. And we were causing a ruckus on the streets. We were chanting. We were basically saying, oh, yeah, I think one of our chants was like, um, es, es, stop, wait, I, oh, what was it? It was in Spanish. I'm trying to think about it because there were so many different chants that we did. But um, it was like, estamos unidos, jamás será vencido. So we are united, we'll never be divided. And I remember we would get people looking at us like we were crazy. We had people who bring out their Confederate flags and tell us to go home back to where we were from. And I was like, I'm from Mississippi. <laughs> I'm where I'm from. And so that was the biggest, most defining moment for me in Mississippi was to be in my own home state, um, working with other organizers against our own legislation and going to the Civil Rights Museum and, and going along a path that someone had laid before me, that, that a person in Mississippi had laid before us. And so it was almost this surreal moment when we got to the Civil Rights Museum um, where Dr. King had been shot in Memphis and James Meredith walks up and he's just talking to us and I'm just like, oh my goodness, how is this possible? Like, how is this even happening? 
how, how am I at this place where there's so much hate, but there's also so much love and so much hope and so much support. And Millsap stood behind me the whole time. Um, you know, anywhere from, you know, allowing Ingrid to live here, <laughs> um, to students asking, you know, how can we get involved? How can we support Youth Organizers United, which eventually turned into an Amnesty International chapter here at Millsaps? I'm not sure if we still have an Amnesty International here, do we? Yeah, yes, no, do we know? Okay, great. So, um, so all of that momentum ended up turning into Amnesty International at our school. We opened, opened up a chapter, and that turned into activism for LGBTQ rights, which turned into activism for women's rights, and this snowball just started to happen. And this was not during the Trump era. This was not during an era where people, where, where we were using the word woke. That wasn't even a thing yet. Um, and so it, it was just a time where students just gave a shit. And we're like, there are terrible things happening. And we knew what legislation was coming out. I didn't even know what HB meant before I got to Millsaps. And I was like, HB 488, don't vote for it. Or call your legislators. I wasn't calling legislators before I got to Millsaps. I didn't know I could do that. I didn't know what legislation was or how it worked. And so I'm really thankful to Millsaps for that experience and the community that embraced me and never told me that I was too liberal or too progressive or too loud. Um, I didn't know I could be that person in Mississippi, but I was, and this was my safe place, and it still is. So thank you. My name is Karm Rahat. Uh, I'm from uh, the class of 2018. Uh, I am at UNC right now, and I just wanted to speak to my experience here. So I came to Millsaps in, in 2014, so right after you left, and I think the tone of the campus after that year left uh, changed a great deal. And there is one issue that comes to mind, I think, that pervaded the campus, I feel, as the prompt stated, but there's before I speak to that, I think the one thing that kind of underscored our entire, my entire time, it was kind of exhausting for my entire time to revolve around this, was the election. Um, but before we got to that point, we were ready to have that conversation. There were so many barriers in the way of us having that discussion. Um, one of which, and uh, one of which I'd say was our liberal identity, Millsaps as a whole, and how we questioned that. Because I think a lot of how we defined ourselves was in relation to the rest of Mississippi. And for better or for worse, but it kind of presupposed a sort of uh, liberal intentionality and all of the interactions you had here, uh, that wasn't actually true once the election came along and it was really disappointing for that moment to have to be the one to get people woke. Um, but there was that, and once that moment had surfaced, there was other barriers that kept us from having a conversation to begin with, and this was the thing that we kept rubbing up, up against was not having the conversation because, and Millsap students do, do this, and this is such a Millsap thing to do, and I love it, but I also hate it, is the focus on like the metacognitive debate, not have the conversation itself, but how we have the conversation. And that pervaded so much of what we did, and it was used as a disqualifying factor sometimes in terms of, oh, you not, you, we can't talk about this yet because we don't know how to talk about it yet. Um, and that, it's really important to have a cultural com like com uh, consciousness and to be able to look back, but we it was used to not to prevent having a foundation from which to have that conversation. There was that, and then it was spoken to earlier, but our relationship to the 1968 generation of class and everything that happened then, I think for a long time kept us from moving forward in this conversation because for a, for a great deal, we were for a while we were trying to be seen as a continuation of what came before, and I think in an effort to sort of legitimize what we were doing, because not to undermine the struggle, but more the success of what happened before. But if you could be seen as that, you had the moral high ground, and for that was a great safety net to have at first. But it also made us one feel beholden, and two, there was so many times for you for someone to come forward and say, "Oh, MLK wouldn't have stood for Black Lives Matter or what you're doing." Um, and I think another barrier, so to speak, was finally coming into our own and saying, no, we're doing, the issues are different, the time is different, the sociological demographic context is different. So this is the Me Too generation, this is the Black Lives Matter generation. Uh, and I think the way we're going to talk about these issues and face these issues is going to be different by necessity. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to move forward. Um, and. That kind of was characterized in our very first things we decided to do when the election happened. 
me and another friend decided, another friend and I decided that we had to do something, that something had to change, that something happened. And by my own like fault, I didn't know that activism and advocacy was a proactive thing rather than a reactive thing. Because that's what it had been, I think, after you left. And you, you were demonstrating sort of proactive advocacy that we hadn't done up to that point. Um, and so when the election happened, we had a demonstration in the bowl, and we came out and we talked about these issues and aired our grievances. But for a long time, even in that conversation, we had to legitimize our own grief, our own, to, to, we had to legitimize the need to have a solid, a moment of solidarity that a lot of people just hadn't bought into yet. And for various reasons, because of this metacognitive debate, because of Millsaps being a liberal campus by necessity. And um, that was difficult. But I'll say, if there was one issue, I think, that pervaded the campus, I would say it came to women's rights on campus. That was, I think, you know, we had the demonstration the bowl. I think, like, race and culture was sort of, multiculturalism was the impetus for that conversation. But, and then we had a candlelight vigil for, the, for immigration when the ban came through. But I'd never seen people as energized as I had when the women's march came about. And the conversation we decided to host after that um, and the reason I say, when, you, when the question mentioned pervaded the comp, like every interaction, that, well, it was feminism, it was women's rights, it was the gender spectrum, it was talking about all those things, because but college, by necessity, when it comes to gender dynamics, is a very charged place. And so it was interesting to see people navigate that while also denying certain issues that were happening right in front of them. And one thing that came to mind for me, uh, um, a student put up, who will remain unnamed, put up a, a set of flyers around campus talking about women in the classroom and issues that, well, the common sense issues that women were having in the classroom um, in, regards to, in, in regards to their, how uh, men treated them and just gender identity and other things. And it was torn down almost immediately. Those flyers were ripped down so quickly, almost overnight. And the, the amount of outrage that came from one side was reassuring, but on the other side, the level of just uh, complacency around that was striking. But then moving forward, one of the, someone decided to repost one of those flyers up, replacing every instance of men with women and women with men, thereby proving the exact point of the original flyer. Um, but I think if I had to say it, it would be that conversation because we still haven't moved forward from that conversation. I think on our campus, uh, you know, uh, professors with PhDs, women being called ma'am, misses, not receiving the respect they deserve. Um, and then when it came to sexual harassment on campus, that was, I think, my senior year, the biggest issue um, that the campus didn't know how to talk about. A lot of that was due to the smaller <laughs> nature, smaller size nature of the campus, but. I think the campus, by the time I had left, still hadn't even had that conversation fully. And I, I, I'm not sure what's happens next, but I hope that that conversation still happens here. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a perfect segue for us to move into our next question. Um, I'm thinking about, for each of our panelists, and then we'll open this up for, I don't think, is this working? Maybe you can hear me, I project pretty well. Um, but in thinking about 2018, where are we now? I mean, for each of you, could you just give us sort of, you know, two or three minutes on what you think is the most pressing issue and how or whether Millsap should be leading in one direction or another? Do you foresee Millsap's role as being more internal? more external, some sort of combination of both. In your experiences as part of the Millsaps community, what is our role today in the issues that face us? Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you don't give up. Um, yeah, the, I, right now, my big role is a Facebook warrior. <laughs> I came back to Mississippi uh, four years ago from a high school reunion in Oxford, Tupelo, and uh, and visited here in Jackson. I, and I put a bunch of, I got a bunch of people on my Facebook, and some of them, and then from those, I got. So there's all these conservative Mississippi people in small towns around North Mississippi that I'm on Facebook with, arguing every day, <laughs> spending way too much time here. But one of the things I've seen that happens is the liberals, they give up and they cut these people off. And they won't keep arguing with them. 
and you cannot do that. I know they repeat the same lies over and over again. We have to, we have to repeat the truth over and over again. And the people on the sidelines are listening. You may not think you ever change those people, but the people on the sidelines are listening and they see who has the truth and who has is more civil, who has the better arguments, and they change. And I saw so much change in my lifetime. I can tell you, there are people today that when I was growing up, they were out and out racist. They, they were proud of being white supremacists. They said they in word, they were just racist. Most of the white people in Mississippi were like that. And those people gradually changed. Everything changed around them. Now those same people are very defensive. They don't want to be called a racist. They, you know, say, I have a black friend. And I just have have they ever come over to your house for dinner? Have you ever voted for a black politician? So even those people, once the whole thing changes, even those hardcore people change. You cannot give up. It's to always two steps far and one step back. We're in a huge step back right now, and it seems hopeless, but it's not. Just keep pushing and keep pushing and keep pushing, and things will change. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I do have a thing to say. Y'all get ready to run out of here in case lightning strikes or something. Um, I should say also that when I said I came out of a, a racist background, I didn't mean to indicate that I was not a part of it. I was, and I am uh, a part of Mississippi and all of its uh, glory and, and uh, badness, too. But um, I, I tried to write this down so I could get it. I'll just have to read it to you. I think that liberalism or left thinking uh, worldwide has a great big blind spot, at least one. You know, we all have a lot of blindnesses, I guess. And that's why Millsap seeing himself and helping us see, see our country and everything is, is so important. Um, and I gather that, that um, the liberal thought at Millsaps also has this blind spot. Um, it, and it, it, to me, it's a sole stress on the victim side. Uh, back in our day, I thought that Millsaps addressed itself to racism uh, to me it did, and I thank God that it did. And today it has widened that focus to include women and persons of various sexual stances and so forth. And to me there is no doubt that all persons of color and uh, any other difference from a norm are in fact victims of all kinds of situations, past and present. But uh, the left thinking today seems to me to stress only that victim side and that a victim can do nothing until the big bad victimizer, whoever that is, uh, the white power structure or the capitalist system or something like that, until that big victimizer changes. In other words, the victim is totally helpless. And this is a very bad thing for uh, us older people to be communicating to younger people. And I've been a teacher for anybody to be communicating to young people that we are helpless. Uh, we have created a large generation of folks, not just people of color, who do not realize that they need to make some significant changes of their own. Uh, slavery, for example, ruthlessly ruined individuals and their culture. And then the sharecropper system and the Jim Crow system uh, kind of cemented a ceiling of really low expectations on the so-called uh, free or newly freed people. And to me, now, uh, liberal thought, with its emphasis only on victimization, when it does that, it's doing its part to keep disadvantaged persons down. Uh, this aspect of liberal thought is really self-defeating. If uh, what we call the Protestant work ethic, you know, work hard, live clean, overcome your barriers, create the kind of life you want, if it worked so well for white Protestants, well then, Let's share it with everybody else, too. Uh, Millsap still stands, I think, in a place of challenging this state <coughs> and this country and the, wor <coughs> the world uh, to examine itself or examine themselves, and I thank God for that. Um, and now Millsap, I think, needs to examine itself, uh, its liberal thinking, and to see if any aspects of it need some overhaul. Thank you. Um, so I 
kind of thought of this as an internal versus external thing. Can y'all hear me? We good? Okay, great. Um, so internally, I would love to hear from the audience um, eventually about where, where we are, especially current students and anyone involved in the projects that are going on in Midtown. So we are in a place of immense privilege, and I think a lot of us know that, even if we are the you know, stereotypical liberal blue spot in the middle of Mississippi, right? We, we are in a place of immense privilege, and we are sitting literally above, on a hill, um, a neighborhood that is not as privileged financially as a lot of the people who are here, even if you came here on scholarship like I did, but you may leave here in a place that is financially different from a lot of the neighborhoods that surround us. And I think that there have been a lot of really wonderful programs that have been developed to be a part of that neighborhood. And so I'm curious to know what those relationships are looking like as Midtown is getting developed, as Fondren is changing a lot, as businesses are coming in. Are we working with communities and not necessarily for them or driving them out? What does our, as we move forward and as Jackson is changing um, in beautiful ways, are we, are we talking about gentrification, which is a huge buzz, buzzword, but like, are, are we doing life and living life with people in the neighborhoods that are changing right now? How are they changing? Are neighbors and leaders in those communities a part of conversation? So I'm very curious to know, I'm not coming at it from an aggressive place, but based on what has happened in other places around the country, especially places around universities, I do have some fear <clears throat> that there are, some, are oftentimes people um, that are not included in conversations, not always unintentionally, but because of the way power structures work and because of the way our society is set up. So that's one thing I think I want to know more about from the audience and would like to have dialogue about that either here or afterwards if that's a topic that is interesting to you and that you care about. And then externally, um, this is a very biased opinion, but I, um, I just resigned from my job this week because I wanted to start an organization called Southern Radical or just a movement or be a part of it. There are Mississippi, I mean, Millsaps is a very diverse place for people that are not necessarily left thinking, of course, right? Um, but it is, and it should be known to many people and is known right now, that it is a place that is safe for people who are Southern, who are from Mississippi, whether it's a small town, Jackson, whatever, who can feel safe here. Some of them for the first time in their lives being gay, being um, trans, being a feminist, being um, you know a, a lot of different identities that aren't always talked about in our smaller towns in Mississippi. I know I there were a lot of things I didn't feel safe expressing until I got to Millsaps, and so I would also say that I think Millsaps moving forward, embracing that that exists here. I think we always have, but even more so as, as the South continues to be in the news, we, you know, especially with social media, in negative ways for xenophobia, for homophobia, for legislation. I mean, people are holding on, gra gripping on to um, power that I think is changing. I don't want to say it's transitioning because I don't know how I feel about exchange of power, but it's changing. And I, and I hope that where we are with this momentum and this generation of people who are talking about things all the time on social media, I hope that we don't shy away from the fact that that exists here um, and that we embrace that this is that place for a lot of people in the South and, and kind of changing the narrative around what does it mean to be Southern? What does it mean to be from Mississippi? <coughs> who are we? What are the narratives that exist here and bringing light to those narratives that I hear at Millsaps? So the biggest thing, and we've already touched on it a good bit uh, in 2018 that stands out to me, I think would be this sort of millennial paralysis. It was present in the millennial generation. Uh, I mean, and, and just a paralysis in, about how to move forward and how to, how to have a conversation. Because even here, we've already talked about conf conflicting ideals, talking about, you know, reach out to the other side, empathy, and like find a common ground in order to bring them over and understand where you're coming from, but also how that sort of recognizes the authority of the oppressor and how that sort of reinforces that victimhood complex. And so it's really difficult to move forward and have that conversation. And the ambiguity that kind of underscores already our experience here with the systematic amount of misinformation that's put out, whether through the media or whether through our own government right now. Um, and then how, what we were talking about, the prior generation and what those marches and everything looked like, that's formed, we've seen those images growing up and that's formed such a strong 
it, like collective consciousness, consciousness in our head of that's what protesting looks like. That's when it's bad. You know, that's what when it, we're not there yet. When it gets bad, that's what it looks like. But things are different now, and we need to approach things differently now. But the issue is, is that um, when you try to engage someone amidst all this ambiguity, and they are operating on a completely other uh, base of facts and domains, you try to come through and you try to find common ground. But there's spheres of people out there who operate on complete, who don't recognize the facts anymore. And so my answer to that is to say, well, if, if, someone, if you can't even sit at the table because they're keep flipping the table over, you don't need to worry about your presentation, whether on social media or how, this, how your tone or your context, because you need to just start talking and have the issue and move forward and have a conversation. And it's really difficult because people come forward and they'll try to police your tone or police your dialogue but when there are people operating without any table to move on, you just have to start having that conversation. It's really difficult because you need a, I'm not saying that they're not, uh, every issue has to be black and white, but we refuse, we have refused to take a stand on issues for so long. And because political socialization is so powerful and the most, uh, I think the most prominent fact uh, place that comes from is from families or familial political socialization. And I think Millsaps' role in all of that is deconstructing that. It's really, really important. I think that's what Millsaps is for. I think we need to come forward and realize where our political socialization is coming from and deconstruct that and understand those and how they shape our influences in moving forward. Not, not because they're inherently bad, because I mean, you're gonna find it really hard to find objective truth and understanding, whether it's coming from these ethical standards or anything outside that realm. But it's about understanding and deconstructing those, those social socializing factors. And I think that's where Millsaps comes in. And moving forward and just talking about the issue and stop being so worried about how the issue is being presented. Because it's been used so long to disqualify any conversation you might try to have. Thank you to each of you for those thoughtful reflections. Um, my, my head is spinning a lot, but I know that you have questions, and I encourage you to offer your own reflections and experience on either one of these questions um, in community with our panelists and with myself and, and with our students here. So I'll just open it up to the floor for a few questions. Yes, please. David, was there a, a road to Damascus event, or were you just raised properly and your activism and youth philosophy at Millsaps? If the latter, was it the church, was it the professors, was it contemporary classes? What influenced you to it? You know, I've tried to figure that out my whole life. <laughs> uh, my father was a liberal. Uh, my, both of my parents were liberals, but it was all behind the scenes. Um, his, his public persona was as a moderate. He was known as a moderate. Uh, but that was, that was a huge part of it. Um, and coming to Millsap, I was already a, a radical, or at least a liberal, before I, I got to Millsap. And it just, I, I was swept along by the times. So I, I, I don't know if I, if I can say. I, I, one of the things that, that that he was talking about that, that made me think uh, about then and now. Uh, there really wasn't a lot of difference between Republicans and Democrats back in the 60s. Uh, and we didn't pay a lot of, us radicals, we didn't pay a lot of attention to electoral politics. It was just so far beyond, and it wasn't a whole lot of difference. That has changed so much. <laughs> There is a huge difference now, and I am very frustrated by young people that withdraw and don't vote or th that want to do some kind of independent thing. The only way to get space for that kind of stuff is to feed Republicans until they no longer have so much power. It's a very different situation right now. My question is for Karam. Karam, I heard um, I was very present on campus your junior year when I think we all saw you sort of emerge as sort of activist leader. And a lot of that came in response to the travel ban, um, which uh, uniquely targeted a population of which you were representative, obviously. 
Um, but as you talked, you know, I'm really hearing you uh, articulate a move from responsive activism in that moment to becoming an activist ally for women, obviously a population you are not representative of. Um, I saw that shift begin to happen as you engaged in some really, really radical acts of deep listening as opposed to speaking. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the things you heard as you were listening that, that empowered you to make that shift and some of the other things that you engaged in that have uh, enabled you to become such a unique activist ally? Okay, you're giving me a lot of credit, but I can speak to my experience um, as far as I can. Um, so one thing that struck me was I, the, the unwillingness to learn from a lot of people that I think I saw that made me want to be a little different. But the general lack of awareness of a, a great deal of issues bothered me so much. Um, I had a lot of people in my class, uh, pre-med, who wanted to be doctors who didn't know how the basics of health insurance in our country worked and how it was disproportionately affecting people of different social classes. And I mean, no one understands how healthcare works in this country. If they do, they're lying to you. No one under, really understands. But, um, and that really bothered me because they would just deny systematic injustices that would happen. And one thing I, that wanted me to move forward was to actually, when I keep saying take a stance on the facts, take a stance on the issues, I realize I haven't quite elucidated what that meant. Um, but, so I would have friends come up and tell me, oh, Karam, my cousin is so Islamophobic, I wish you could talk to him, you could set him straight. Uh, I tried telling him that Islam is a non-violent religion and all these things, but he just doesn't listen. And I said, that's great, what you're doing is great. You know Islam is a non-violent religion and you're trying to have that conversation. The thing is though, is that you don't know why. You haven't listened. The go and saying to people, it's so difficult now. But people need, when I'm talking about the misinformation out there, people need to stay educated on the facts. People, when, so when I say know why, go look up the verses in the Quran that are common conservative topic, talking points and understand the context behind that. Go do your homework because people don't. And that is incredibly frustrating because how can you have this conversation if you don't know what you're talking about? And so, and one way you learn is by listening to people, listening to people's experiences and moving forward because you know the way, like, and be able to have, understand what's happening and you do that through looking at these studies, looking at research, reading what's, reading about what's happening. But that only covers so much because of just the, the, the biased nature in which these studies are done. You need to look at people's experiences as well. And um, I think, so for me, medical advocacy is incredibly important once you realize how medicine is distributed across the nation. And I'm not saying that everything you have to do has to have a social justice um, portion to it, but if you realize the reality of so many different, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, institutions, I guess, here in the nation, um, you would realize how they disproportionately affect different people differently. Um, and so I'd say do your homework, look at all people talking about how Black Lives Matter, there's no need, but if you look, the Department of Justice did a study and found out that police officers are more likely to shoot black men for doing the exact same actions that white men are doing in the same situations, you know? This happens when you, when you talk about these issues and like look up Sandra Bland, you know, look up, you know, Trayvon Martin, know their names, know what happened to them and know why. Um, I think that's really important because otherwise you just become a talking head, a pundit for liberal issues and liberal causes. And I, I think what sets liberalism apart just by the very notion is the willingness to not just have these views, but just to have these views supported by actual critical thinking and facts and looking. And that's what brought you to these views in the very first place. Um, so that's my input, I guess. Other questions? I have a question. Yes, please. Um, I would like all of you to address the question, um, baby boomers, of whom we are the leading edge, um, are now being chastised for what we're reading, what we've done. And I would like you all to address, if you would, um, our idealism, activism, what happened? And what do we do now? And how can young people help, help us realize the potential that we did have? And still have. Um, repeat the question. 
<laughs> I, I, I guess it was what what happened to baby boomers? What, what, what's our real legacy and, and what? Right. What yeah. Our, our idealism and our right. activism, yeah. and somehow we got off the tracks with no, we that. Didn't. No, we did not. Well, <laughs> then here's the, here's the problem. We were always a minority among the baby boomers. The big majority of baby boomers were conservatives. At Millsaps, we were a small group. We, we sat over in the booths in the grill we called the booth group. <laughs> the, you know, maybe a third of the campus was, was uh, moderate, and half, at least, or at least a third to a half, were conser outright conservatives, even back then. And throughout the baby boomer years, the, the radicals and liberals among us, we, we got out there and we did all this stuff. We were never the majority, and there was always a backlash. So everything that's happened since then has been this back and forth within the baby boomers between the liberals and the conservatives. Uh, and it's, it's still going on. Look, look who's there. Trump, the Clintons, they're all the forefront of the baby boomers. And it's, we're still fighting it out between them. It's, it's very soon going to move on. And it's, it's going to change because the other generations are progressively more liberal and progressive than the baby boomers were. So yeah. the baby boomers who were liberal and progressive they stayed that way. They didn't change. Um, well, a lot all of us raised children. We know. raised children, and the ones that I know right there, are, were, were in professions. They were in healthcare, social work, and lawyers and, and stuff. They didn't change. It, but it seems like things changed because of the back and forth that went on between the different factions within the baby boomers. That, that's okay. good. Yeah. No, I have not much to say. Uh, one of my nieces and I have a joke about uh, the children of liberals. And uh, in so many cases, I don't know whose toes I'm going to step on here, but in so many cases, the children of li liberals my age and a little bit younger are really kind of undirected. They don't know what, you know, what to do with their lives. Well, what does that mean? I don't know. I don't know. I'll just hang that there as a question. I'm going to pose your question with a question. What do you think that baby boomers are leaving behind currently? Um, a lot of good ideas that maybe from what David said about the backing and forthing, we have not been good on. And I, I think at the national level, um, even when we have been in power, we have been so compromised because of the fundraising and um, corruption, um, that we haven't always lived out our ambitions in, in our ideals. Um, I think we're leaving some things much, much better than we found them when we were your age. Um, but we are so polarized now that I think it is very difficult for y'all even to have conversations with people who don't agree with you. And there is the listening, and we certainly all need to work on that. Um, so that's that's what I think. Was that information? Or yes, thank you. And or I, thank you, no, no. And all I can do is speak from my mother's perspective, who was a baby boomer, and she just said, I'm tired, it's time for you to carry the torch. And so I think that I learn, we, we talk to each other a lot, I listen a lot, um, and so I guess for me it's just letting us have the torch while also being there to guide us carrying it. I don't know, you know, there's a lot of <coughs> spaces in the world and mm -hmm. I don't think it's something that it's an either or, I think it's a both and, but I just know from her perspective she's tired and so I think that my responsibility, I feel like I do have a lot of energy, but I also have a lot to learn. And so I just ask a lot of questions. Yeah, so I guess just be there for us to ask questions yeah. and also be there with us in this moment. So I think the baby boomer generation left for us an ideal to strive for in terms of the civil rights and moving forward from that. Uh, one that we can't exactly emulate, but one that we can sort of capture the spirit of. But I'll also say, you know, object to a company that also left us a dying planet, uh, cra crashed housing market, and um, a huge wage gap. 
And that's kind of defined our experience moving forward, especially post-college for a lot of my friends. Um, but one thing I have realized just from sitting here right before we started was just talking about a lot of these issues is that, um, so baby boomers make up still a large proportion of our population. And those um, millennials are bigger now. We're reaching, yes, okay. Um, <laughs> and so, but what was so comforting, because for a long time it felt like, and why we had a difficulty getting started was that we were going up against such a heavily entrenched institution. Um, and that was so difficult just to brush up against and push through. And we've kind of found our voice now, things are changing, I feel, but, that being said, it was so comforting to sit down and have this conversation and just feel like there's still people who transcend generations that have a similar mindset. You know, that was incredibly comforting. Just now, in the last hour, we sat down, we started talking before this happened. And I, I think it, it, you, you cannot overstate how much, I think it is really important for us to come into our own and take a stand and have our own conversations, but how much, like you were saying, that guidance really, really means going forward, just having people, just knowing, because for, for a while, we have felt isolated. I can't speak for the generation, but I think as a whole, I, I think that feeling of isolation that's present in alienation, that's present in this, and, and culture has changed so much. Um, and that's, that's understandable. But having someone, maybe not with the exact same views, that's kind of hard to get, but just someone who had that mindset growing up and maintained that mindset growing up. Because a lot of people will tell you, oh, you're liberal now, but when you're old, you'll be a conservative, you know? And, um, That's a myth. Right, and so just having that dispel, I'm not saying that like I didn't believe in it before today, but just like being able to be in a space with, and I have to, I have to say, like in, in a non, non, I don't mean this in a negative way, but being in a room with, with folks who grew up in a different time, who don't look like me, you know, I would normally be uncomfortable in this space, but I feel like I have a safe space right now in which to engage in this conversation. I was really worried I was gonna have to moderate how I spoke today. And now I, I, now as the conversation has gone on, I feel like I can talk a, a bit more freely. And that does wonders for us as a generation. So if you're going to do something, do this, keep doing this, keep reaching out to people who you see out there right now and let them know that you're with them.
it requires patience and uncertainty. And um, as, as Alec and David and many of you, I think, would attest, when you are involved with these movements and with agencies and, and with things that you're passionate about, there's no guarantee that what you're doing is going to work. But you showed up anyway, and, and you continue to work toward that end. And I think many of us in this room are continuing to work in that direction. So despair does not have to abound. We are all responsible for the world that we live in, and we should take mentorship from each other, and we should listen um, to the lessons of the future and, and what you know, new ways to attract these things. Ultimately, we are talking about many of the same issues, and I think there's a lot to learn from the experiences of, of great folks like yourself in the past. So thank you to all of our panelists for such thoughtful reflections on this, and I hope you feel energized to continue to have those conversations here with each other back home, and happy homecoming. Thank you.